चल छैया 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 चल छैया 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 चल छैया 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 चल छैया 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 चल छैया 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 चल छैया 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 सारे शिक की छाव चल छैया छैया सारे शिक की छाव चल छैया पाओ जनत चले चल छैया छैया पाओ जनत चले चल छैया चल छैया 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 Queen of the screen, 35 mil, she's got the old P in LA, and he's king of the hill. Bollywood love story, straight out of the film. I've seen her before, but we can handle it for real. The earth shook when we came together, when she put the biggest diamond on my and choppy track. That was the moment she brought the world together. Right now, all I gotta do is show my love now. Good boy, she can be in the right, ताबीज बना के पहन उसे आयत की तरह मिल जाए कहीं ताबीज बना के पहन उसे आयत की तरह मिल जाए कहीं बुलबोश कभी इतना ही कहीं महके तो नजर आ जाए कहीं In a nutshell, the partition of India of 1947 was the division of British India into two independent dominion states, India and Pakistan. The dominion of India is today the Republic of India. The dominion of Pakistan is today the Islamic Republic of Pakistan and the People's Republic of Bangladesh. The partition involved the division of two provinces, Bengal and Punjab, based on either non-Muslim or Muslim majorities. The partition also saw the division of the British Indian Army, the Royal Indian Navy, the Indian Civil Service, the Railways, and the Central Treasury. The partition also resulted in the dissolution of the British Raj, or Crown Rule in India. The two self-governing countries of India and Pakistan legally came into existence at midnight on the 15th of August, 1947. However, the partition displaced between 10 to 12 million people along religious lines, creating a series of overwhelming refugee crises in the newly constituted dominions. There was large-scale violence, with estimates of loss of life accompanying or preceding the partition varying between several hundred thousand and two million. The violent nature of the partition created an atmosphere of hostility and suspicion between the two states of India and Pakistan that still troubles their relationship to this day. The partition of India does not include the secession of Bangladesh from Pakistan, which took place in 1971, nor the earlier separations of Burma, now Myanmar, 
and Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, from the administration of British India. It also does not cover the political integration of princely states into the two new dominions, nor the disputes arising in the princely states of Hyderabad, Junagadh, and Jammu and Kashmir, though violence along religious lines did break out in some princely states at the time of the partition. In 1905, during his second term as Viceroy, or Governor of India, Lord George Nathaniel Curzon divided the Bengal Presidency, the largest administrative subdivision in British India, into the Muslim-majority province of Eastern Bengal and Assam and the Hindu-majority province of Bengal, which is present-day Indian states of West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand and Odisha. This partition of Bengal was not viewed favorably by the Hindu elite of Bengal, many of whom owned land that was leased out to Muslim peasants in East Bengal. The large Bengali Hindu middle class, the Badralok, upset at the prospect of Bengalis being outnumbered in the new Bengal province by Biharis and Oriyas, felt that Kurzan's act was punishment for their political assertiveness. The pervasive protests against Kurzan's decision predominantly took the form of the Sodeshi, or Buy Indian campaign, involving a boycott of British goods. Sporadically, but flagrantly, the protesters also took to political violence, which involved attacks on civilians. The violence, however, would be ineffective, as most planned attacks were either preempted by the British or failed. The rallying cry for both types of protest was the slogan, Bandi Mataram, which is the Bengali for Hail to the Mother, the title of a song by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, which invoked a mother goddess who represented Bengal, India and the Hindu goddess Kali. The unrest spread from Calcutta to the surrounding regions of Bengal when Calcutta's English educated students returned home to their villages and towns. The religious stirrings of the slogan and the political outrage of the partition were combined as young men resorted to bombing public buildings, staging armed robberies and assassinating British officials. Since Kolkata was the imperial capital of British India, both the outrage and the slogan soon became known nationally. The overwhelming, predominantly Hindu protest against the partition of Bengal, along with the fear of reforms favouring the Hindu majority, led the Muslim elite of India in 1906 to consult with the new Viceroy Lord Minto, Gilbert Elliot Murray Kinnamond, asking for separate electorates for Muslims. In conjunction, they demanded proportional legislative representation reflecting both their status as former rulers and their record of cooperating with the British. This would result in the founding of the All India Muslim League in Dakar in December 1906. Although Curzon by now had returned to England following his resignation, the League was in favour of his partition plan. The Muslim elite's position, which was reflected in the League's position, had formed gradually over the previous 30 years, beginning with the 1871-1872 census of British India, which had been the first census to estimate the populations in regions of Muslim majority. For his part, Curzon's desire to court the Muslims of East Bengal had arisen from British anxieties ever since the 1871-1872 census, and in the light of the history of Muslims fighting the British in the Indian Rebellion of 1857 and the Second Anglo-Afghan War of 1878-1880. In the three decades since the census, Muslim leaders across northern India had intermittently experienced public hostility from some of the emerging Hindu political and social groups. In the British Indian Territory of the United Provinces of Agra and Oud, Muslims became anxious in the late 19th century as Hindu political representation increased and Hindus were politically mobilized in the Hindu-Urdu controversy and the anti-cow killing riots of 1893. In 1905, Muslim fears grew when Baal Gangadhar Tilak and Lajpat Rai, both Indian nationalists, attempted to rise to leadership positions in the Indian National Congress, or the INC. It was not lost on many Muslims, for example, that the Bande Mataram rallying cry had first appeared in the novel Anandmat, 
in which Hindus had battled their Muslim oppressors. Lastly, the Muslim elites were aware that a new province with the Muslim majority would directly benefit Muslims aspiring to political power. The First World War would prove to be a watershed in the imperial relationship between Britain and India. 1.4 million Indian and British soldiers of the British Indian Army would take part in the war and their participation would have a wider cultural fallout. News of Indian soldiers fighting and dying alongside British soldiers as well as soldiers from other British dominions such as Canada and Australia reached almost every corner of the world, mostly thanks to a new medium called the radio. India's international profile would therefore rise and would continue to rise during the 1920s. It was to lead, among other things, to India becoming a founding member of the League of Nations in 1920 and participating under the name Les Indes Anglais or British India in the 1920 Summer Olympics in Antwerp. In India, especially among the leaders of the INC, these changes would lead to calls for greater self-government for Indians. The 1916 Lucknow session of the INC led to an unanticipated agreement between itself and the Muslim League due to the partnership between Germany and the Ottoman Empire. Since the Ottoman Sultan has sporadically claimed guardianship of the Islamic holy sites of Mecca, Medina and Jerusalem, and since the British and their allies were now in conflict with the Ottoman Empire, doubts began to increase among some Indian Muslims about the religious neutrality of the British. In the Lucknow Pact, the League joined the INC in the proposal for greater self-government that was campaigned for by Tilak and his supporters. In return, the INC accepted separate electorates for Muslims in the provincial legislatures as well as the Imperial Legislative Council. In 1916, the League had anywhere between 500 and 800 members only. The Lucknow Pact did not have unanimous support within the League itself, as it had largely been negotiated by a group of young party Muslims from the United Provinces most prominently, who had embraced the pan-Islamic cause. However, it did have the support of a young lawyer from Bombay, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who would later rise to leadership roles in both the League and the Indian independence movement. In later years, as the full ramifications of the pact unfolded, it was seen as benefiting the Muslim minority elites of provinces like the United Provinces and Bihar more than the Muslim majorities of Punjab and Bengal. At the time, the Lucknow Pact was an important milestone in nationalistic provocation. In July 1918, Secretary of State for India, Edwin Samuel Montague and Viceroy Lord Chelmsford, Frederick John Napier Thesiger, presented a report after a long fact-finding trip through India. After more discussion by the government and parliament in Britain, and a tour by the Franchise and Functions Committee to identify who among the Indian population could vote in future elections, the Government of India Act of 1919, also known as the Montague Chelmsford Reforms, was passed in December 1919. The new act enlarged both the provincial and imperial legislative councils and repealed the government of India's recourse to the official majority in unfavorable votes. Although departments like defense, foreign affairs, criminal law, communications and income tax were retained by the viceroy and the central government in New Delhi, other departments like public health, education, land revenue, and local self-government were transferred to the provinces. The provinces themselves were now to be administered under a new diarchical system, a system of government where a polity is co-ruled by two or more individuals or entities. Thus, some areas like education, agriculture, infrastructure, development, and local self-government became the exclusive portfolios of Indian ministers and legislatures and ultimately the Indian electorates, while others like irrigation, land revenue, police, prisons, and control of media remained within the control of the British governor and his executive council. The new act also made it easier for Indians to be admitted into the civil service and the army officer corps. 
A greater number of Indian males were also given the right to vote, although for voting at the national levels, they constituted only 10% of the total adult male population. In the provincial legislatures, the British continued to exercise some control by setting aside seats for special interests they considered cooperative or useful. In particular, rural candidates generally sympathetic to British rule and less confrontational were assigned more seats than their urban counterparts. Seats were also reserved for non-Brahmins, landowners, businessmen and college graduates. The principle of communal representation, an integral part of the Lucknow Pact, was reaffirmed with seats being reserved for Muslims, Sikhs, Indians, Christians, Anglo-Indians and domiciled Europeans in both provincial and imperial legislative councils. The Montague Chelmsford reforms offered Indians the most significant opportunity up until that point for exercising legislative power, especially at the provincial level. However, this was also restricted by the number of eligible voters, small budgets available to provincial legislatures, and by the presence of rural and special interest seats that were seen as instruments of British control. Now the two-nation theory is the ideology that the primary identity and unifying denominator of Muslims in the Indian subcontinent is their religion rather than their language or ethnicity. Therefore, Indian Hindus and Muslims are two distinct nations regardless of commonalities in language or from what ethnic group they are from. The ideology that religion is the determining factor in defining the nationality of Indian Muslims was undertaken by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who termed it as the awakening of Muslims for the creation of Pakistan. It is also a source of inspiration to several Hindu nationalist organizations, with causes as varied as the redefinition of Indian Muslims as non-Indian foreigners and second-class citizens in India, the expulsion of all Muslims from India, establishment of a legally Hindu state in India, prohibition of conversions to Islam, and the promotion of conversions or reconversions of Indian Muslims to Hinduism. Vajpad Rai was one of the first people to demand the division of India into Muslim and non-Muslim populations. He wrote in the Tribune of the 14th of December 1924, Under my scheme, the Muslims will have four Muslim states, the Pathan province or the northwest frontier, western Punjab, Sindh and Eastern Bengal. If there are small Muslim communities in any other part of India sufficiently large to form a province, they should be similarly constituted. But it should be distinctly understood that this is not a united India. It means a clear partition of India into Muslim India and a non-Muslim India. There are varying interpretations of the two-nation theory based on whether the two suggested nationalities can coexist in one territory or not, with radically different implications. One interpretation argued for sovereign autonomy, including the right for Muslim-majority areas to secede from India, but without any transfer of populations. That is, Hindus and Muslims would continue to live together. A different interpretation contends that Hindus and Muslims constitute two distinct and frequently antagonistic ways of life, and that therefore they cannot coexist in one nation. In this version, a transfer of populations, that is the total removal of Hindus from Muslim majority areas and the total removal of Muslims from Hindu majority areas, was a desirable step towards a complete separation of two incompatible nations that cannot coexist in a harmonious relationship. However, there was and still remains strong opposition to this theory. The first is the concept of a single Indian nation of which Hindus and Muslims are two intertwined communities. This was the founding principle of the modern secular Republic of India. Even after the formation of Pakistan, debates on whether Muslims and Hindus are distinct nationalities or not continued in that country. The second source of opposition is the concept that while Indians are not one nation, neither are the Muslims or Hindus, and it's instead the relatively homogeneous provincial units of the Indian subcontinent 
which are true nations and deserving of sovereignty. In other words, the sub-nationalities within India have more of a claim to sovereignty than the Muslims or Hindus. In 1933, Shudri Rahmat Ali produced a pamphlet entitled Now or Never, in which the term Pakistan, land of the pure, was reputedly coined for the first time. This area, comprised of the Punjab, Northwest Frontier or Afghania, Kashmir, Sindh and Baluchistan. However, the pamphlet did not attract political attention and a little later, a Muslim delegation to the Parliamentary Committee on Indian Constitutional Reforms dismissed the idea of Pakistan. In 1932, British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald accepted jurist Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's demand for the depressed classes to have separate representation in the central and provincial legislatures. The Muslim League favoured separate representation as it had the potential to weaken the Hindu caste leadership. However, lawyer, political activist and Indian nationalist Mahatma Gandhi, seen as a leading advocate for rights of the lower classes, went on a fast to persuade the British to repeal separate representation. Ambedkar had to back down when it seemed Gandhi's life was threatened. Two years later, the Government of India Act of 1935 introduced provincial autonomy, increasing the number of voters in India to 35 million. More significantly, law and order issues were for the first time devolved from British authority to provincial governments headed by Indians. This increased Muslim concerns about eventual Hindu domination. In the 1937 Indian provincial elections, the Muslim League turned out its best performance in Muslim minority provinces, such as the United Provinces, where it won 29 of the 64 reserved Muslim seats. However, in the Muslim majority regions of the Punjab and Bengal, regional parties outperformed the League. In the Punjab, the Unionist Party of Sikandar Hayat Khan won the elections and formed a government with the support of the Indian National Congress and the Shiromani Akali Dal, a six-centric political party which lasted five years. In Bengal, the League had to share power in a coalition headed by A.K. Fazul Haq, the leader of the leftist Krishak Praja party in Bengal. The INC, on the other hand, with 716 wins in the total of 1,585 provincial assembly seats, was able to form governments in 7 out of the 11 provinces of British India. In its manifesto, the INC maintained that religious issues were of lesser importance to the masses than economic and social issues. However, the election revealed that the Congress had contested just 58 out of the total 482 Muslim seats, and of these, it won in only 26. In the United Provinces, where the INC won, it offered to share power with the League on condition that the League stop functioning as a representative only of Muslims, which the League refused. This proved to be a mistake, as it alienated the INC further from the Muslim masses. Besides, the new United Provinces Provincial Administration promulgated cow protection and the use of Hindi. The Muslim elite in the United Provinces was further alienated when they saw chaotic scenes in areas won by the INC, where rural people who turned up in large numbers in government buildings were indistinguishable from the administrators and the law enforcement personnel. The Muslim League conducted its investigation into the conditions of Muslims under INC government provinces. The findings of such investigations increased fear among the Muslim masses of future Hindu domination. The view that Muslims would be unfairly treated in an independent India dominated by the INC was now a part of the public opinion of Muslims. With the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, British Lord Linlithgow Victor Alexander John Hope, then Viceroy of India, declared war on India's behalf without consulting Indian leaders leading the INC provincial ministries to resign in protest. In contrast, the Muslim League, which functioned due to the financial support of the state, 
organized Deliverance Day celebrations and supported Britain in the war effort. When Linlithgow met with nationalist leaders, he gave the same status to Jinnah as he did to Gandhi, and a month later described the INC as a Hindu organization. In March 1940, in the League's annual three-day session in Lahore, Jinnah gave a two-hour speech in English in which were laid out the arguments of the two-nation theory, stating that Muslims and Hindus were irreconcilably opposed religious communities. Therefore, no settlement could be imposed that did not satisfy the aspirations of the Muslims as well. On the last day of its session, the League passed what came to be known as the Lahore Resolution, sometimes also known as the Pakistan Resolution, demanding that the areas in which the Muslims are numerically in the majority, as in the northwestern and eastern zones of India, should be grouped to constitute independent states in which the constituent units shall be autonomous and sovereign. In August 1940, Lord Linlithgow proposed that India be granted a dominion status after the war. Having not taken the Pakistan idea seriously, Linlithgow assumed that Jinnah wanted a non-federal arrangement without Hindu domination. To allay Muslim fears of Hindu domination, this so-called August offer was accompanied by the promise that a future constitution would consider the views of minorities. Neither the INC nor the Muslim League were satisfied with the offer and both rejected it in September. The INC once again started a program of civil disobedience. In March 1942, with the Japanese fast moving up the Malayan Peninsula after the fall of Singapore, and with the Americans supporting independence for India, Winston Churchill, the wartime Prime Minister of Britain, sent Sir Stafford Cripps, leader of the House of Commons, with an offer of dominion status to India at the end of the war in return for the INC's support for the war effort. Not wishing to lose the support of the Allies they had already secured, Cripps's offer included a clause stating that none of the British Indian Empire would be forced to join the post-war dominion. The League rejected the offer, seeing this clause as insufficient in meeting the principle of Pakistan. As a result of that proviso, the proposals were also rejected by the INC. In August 1942, the INC launched a Quit India Resolution asking for drastic constitutional changes which the British saw as the most serious threat to their rule since the Indian Rebellion of 1857. With their resources and attention already spread thin by the war, the British immediately jailed the INC leaders and kept them in jail until August 1945, whereas the League was now free for the next three years to spread its message. As a result, the League's ranks surged during the war, with Jinnah himself admitting the war, which nobody welcomed, proved to be a blessing in disguise. Although there were other important national Muslim politicians such as INC leader Abu Kalam Azad and influential region Muslim politicians such as A.K. Fazul al-Haq, Sikandar Hayat Khan and Abdul Ghaffar Khan of the pro-INC Kudai Kidmatgar known as the Red Shirts in the Northwest Frontier Province, the British increasingly saw the League as the main representative of Muslim India. The League's demand for Pakistan pitted it not only against the INC, but also against the British. In January 1946, mutinies broke out in the armed services. The insurgencies came to a head in February 1946 with the mutiny of the Royal Indian Navy in Bombay, followed by others in Calcutta, Madras and Karachi. Although the mutinies were quickly suppressed, they had the effect of spurring the British government into action. The new British Prime Minister, Kermit Atty, had been deeply interested in Indian independence since the 1920s and for years had supported it. He now took charge of the government position and gave the issue the highest priority. A cabinet mission was sent to India led by the Secretary of State for India, Lord Frederick Patrick Lawrence. The objective of the mission was to arrange for an orderly transfer to independence. In early 1946, 
New provincial elections were held in India. With the announcement of the polls, the line had been drawn for Muslim voters to choose between a united Indian state or partition. At the end of World War II, the colonial government had announced a public trial of three senior officers of Subhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army, or the INA, who stood accused of treason. As the trials began, the INC leadership, although having never supported the INA, chose to defend the accused officers. The subsequent convictions of the officers, the public outcry against the beliefs, and the eventual lessening of the sentences created positive propaganda for the INC, which enabled it to win the party's subsequent electoral victories in eight of the eleven provinces. The negotiations between the INC and the League, however, stumbled over the issue of partition. British rule had lost its legitimacy for most Hindus, and conclusive proof of this came in the form of the 1946 elections with the INC winning 91% of the vote among non-Muslim constituencies, thereby gaining a majority in the central legislature and forming governments in eight provinces and becoming the legitimate successor to the British government for most Hindus. If the British intended to stay in India, the agreement of politically active Indians to British rule would have been in doubt after these election results, although the views of many rural Indians were uncertain even at that point. The Muslim League won the majority of the Muslim vote, as well as most reserved Muslim seats in the provincial assemblies, and it also secured all the Muslim seats in the central assembly. Recovering from its performance in the 1937 elections, the League was finally able to make good on the claim that it and Jinnah alone represented India's Muslims and Jinnah quickly interpreted this vote as a popular demand for a separate homeland. However, tensions heightened as the League was unable to form ministries outside the two provinces of Sindh and Bengal, with the INC forming a ministry in the northwest frontier province and the key Punjab province coming under a coalition ministry of the INC, Sikhs and Unionists. The British, while not approving of a separate Muslim homeland, appreciated the simplicity of a single voice to speak on behalf of India's Muslims. Britain had wanted India and its army to remain united to keep India in its system of imperial defence. With India's two political parties unable to agree, Britain devised a cabinet mission plan. Through this mission, Britain hoped to preserve the united India which they and the INC desired while concurrently securing the essence of Jinnah's demand for Pakistan through groupings. The cabinet mission scheme encapsulated a federal arrangement consisting of three groups of provinces. Two of these groupings would consist of predominantly Muslim provinces, while the third grouping would be made up of the predominantly Hindu regions. The provinces would be autonomous, but the central government would retain control over the defence, foreign affairs, and communications. Though the proposals did not offer independent Pakistan, the Muslim League accepted the proposals. Even though the unity of India would have been preserved, the INC leaders, especially Jarawal Nehru, believed it would leave the central government weak. On the 10th of July 1946, Nehru gave a provocative speech, rejected the idea of grouping the provinces and effectively torpedoed both the cabinet mission plan and the prospect of a united India. After the cabinet mission broke down, Jinnah proclaimed the 16th of August 1946 to be direct action day, with the stated goal of peacefully highlighting the demand for Muslim homeland in British India. However, on the morning of the 16th, Armed Muslim gangs gathered at the Octoloni Monument in Calcutta to hear Hussein Shahid Shawawardi, the League's chief minister of Bengal, who, in the words of historian Yasmin Khan, if he did not explicitly incite violence, certainly gave the crowd the impression that they could act with impunity, that neither the police nor the military would be called out, and that the ministry would turn a blind eye to any action they unleashed in the city. That very evening in Calcutta, 
Hindus were attacked by returning Muslims who carried pamphlets distributed earlier which showed a clear connection between violence and the demand for Pakistan and directly implicated the celebration of Direct Action Day with the outbreak of the cycle of violence that would later be called the Great Calcutta Killing of August 1946. The next day, Hindus struck back and the violence continued for three days in which approximately 4,000 people died, according to official accounts, both Hindus and Muslims. Although India had had outbreaks of religious violence between Hindus and Muslims before, the Calcutta killings were the first to display elements of ethnic cleansing. Violence was not confined to the public sphere, but homes were entered into and destroyed, and women and children were attacked. The communal violence spread to Bihar, where Hindus attacked Muslims, Noakali in Bengal, where Muslims targeted Hindus, Ganmut Keshwar in the United Provinces, where Hindus attacked Muslims, and then to Rawalpindi in March 1947, in which Hindus were attacked or driven out by Muslims. Although the government of India and the INC were both shaken by the course of events, in September 1946, an INC-led interim government was installed, with Jawaharlal Nehru as United India's Prime Minister. Atri appointed Lord Louis Mountbatten as India's last Viceroy, giving him the task to oversee British India's independence by June 1948, with the instruction to avoid partition and preserve a united India, but with the necessary authority to ensure a British withdrawal with minimal setbacks. Mountbatten hoped to revive the cabinet mission scheme for a federal arrangement for India, but despite his initial keenness for preserving the centre, the tense communal situation caused him to conclude that partition had become necessary for a quicker transfer of power. Sardar Vallabhai Patel was one of the first INC leaders to accept the partition of India as a solution to the rising Muslim separatist movement led by Jinnah. He had been outraged by Jinnah's direct action campaign as well as by the Viceroy's vetoes of his Home Department's plans to stop the violence on the grounds of constitutionality. Patel severely criticised the Viceroy's induction of League ministers into the government and the revalidation of the grouping scheme by the British without INC approval. However, Patel was aware that Jinnah enjoyed popular support amongst Muslims and that an open conflict between him and the nationalists could degenerate into a Hindu-Muslim civil war. The continuation of a divided and weak central government would, in Patel's mind, result in the wider fragmentation of India by encouraging more than 600 princely states towards independence. Between the months of December 1946 and January 1947, Patel worked with civil servant VP Menon, who suggested a separate dominion of Pakistan created out of Muslim-majority provinces. Communal violence in Bengal and Punjab in January and March 1947 further convinced Patel of the soundness of partition. Patel, a fierce critic of Jinnah's demand that the Hindu-majority areas of Punjab and Bengal be included in a Muslim state, obtained the partition of those provinces, thus blocking any possibility of their inclusion in Pakistan. Patel's decisiveness on the partition of Punjab and Bengal had won him many supporters and admirers amongst the Indian public who had been tired of the League's tactics. Still, he was criticised by Gandhi, Nehru, secular Muslims and socialists for perceived eagerness for the partition. The British government proposed a plan that included the following principles. Partition accepted by the British government, successor governments would be given dominion status, autonomy and sovereignty to both countries, India and Pakistan, they would be allowed to create their own constitution, the princely states would be given the right to join either India or Pakistan, and lastly, there remained the possibility that provinces could become a separate nation other than India or Pakistan. 
when Lord Mountbatten formally proposed the plan on the 3rd of June 1947, Patel gave his approval and lobbied Nehru and other INC leaders to accept the proposal. Knowing Gandhi's deep anguish regarding the proposal of partition, Patel engaged him in private discussions over the perceived practical unworkability of any Congress League coalition, the rising violence and the threat of civil war. At the All India Congress Committee meeting that was called to vote on the proposal, Patel said, I fully appreciate the fears of our brothers from the Muslim majority areas. Nobody likes the division of India and my heart is heavy, but the choice is between one division and many divisions. We must face facts. We cannot give way to emotionalism and sentimentality. The working committee has not acted out of fear, but I am afraid of one thing, that all our toil and hard work of these many years might go to waste or prove unfruitful. My nine months in office have completely disillusioned me regarding the supposed merits of the cabinet mission plan. Except for a few honourable exceptions, Muslim officials from the top down to the chaprasas or the servants are working for the league. The communal veto given to the league in the mission plan would have blocked India's progress at every stage. Whether we like it or not, de facto Pakistan already exists in the Punjab and Bengal. Under the circumstances, I would prefer a de jure Pakistan, which may make the league more responsible. Freedom is coming. We have 75 to 80 percent of India, which we can make strong with our genius. The league can develop the rest of the country. Following Gandhi's rejection and the INC's approval of the plan, Patel represented India on the Partition Council where he oversaw the division of public assets and selected the Indian Council of Ministers with Nehru. However, neither he nor any other Indian leader could foresee the intense violence and population transfer that would take place with partition. Meanwhile, Mountbatten brought forward the date for the transfer of power, allowing less than six months for a mutually agreed plan for independence. Thus, the process of independence and partition would be quickened in an atmosphere where the entire British India was already aggravated by the prospect of division. Violence seemed inevitable.